And uh, we have uh, one of our very, very few uh, Zoom lectures. This is Katrin Andreasen that's with us from California. She uh, heard herself. Uh, Katrin, can you, uh, can you see us? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. <laughs> hey, you have a full crowd here. We're about, I think, 400 people in the room right now, and there's probably 4,000 people watching online. So we're very excited that you could, uh, that you could make it. Um, you can share your screen whenever you're ready, and then uh, start your talk, and we're very excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so I hope everyone can see. So thank you so much, uh, Daniela and the organizers. I'm very sorry I can't be there, but I have, uh, of all things, a running injury, and it's kind of hard to hobble around the airports uh, with a knee problem. So um, so today uh, I'm going to speak about uh, immune med immune metabolic mechanisms of cognitive decline and aging, and um, actually picking up uh, from, from Tony's talk, um, sort of zeroing in on a very powerful immune pathway uh, that uh, really drives uh, uh, systemic aging and brain aging. So I'll start by stating the obvious, which uh, we all know uh, with aging comes uh, disease promoting chronic inflammation. So uh, pretty much most of all age associated diseases uh, have an inflammatory uh, basis. Uh, in, uh, inflammation uh, maybe initiates, but certainly enables uh, development of very detrimental inflammation that drives a lot of these diseases that are listed here. Now, if we look in uh, and zero in on the immune system, specifically the innate immune system, so our, our primary defense, we, we know at the cellular level that with aging, there's a sort of flip between the myeloid and the lymphoid ratio. So more myeloid cells, fewer lymphoid cells. Um, we also know that uh, myeloid cells lose their homeostasis, uh, immune, response, uh, immune responses. And, um, and we also found uh, very surprisingly that as we age, our macrophages and myeloid cells uh, lose their endogenous circadian rhythmicity and uh, so that's actually very detrimental because there are uh, there's circadian rhythmicity to cellular trafficking from the bone marrow, to immune responses, antigen presentation, cytokine production, et cetera. Now in the brain, which is what um, I'm actually most interested in as a neurologist, we lose uh, microglial function. So that results in accumulation of toxic uh, misfolded proteins like amyloid or tau, um, and then, of course, dysregulated pruning of synapses. And so the net result of this dysfunctional aging immune system is uh, end organ injury, you know, commonly atherosclerosis, which is a disease of macrophages, arthritis, liver fibrosis, sarcopenia, et cetera. So, um, and I just want to, uh, again, state what most people know. For example, if we think about uh, a very, very uh, prevalent neurodegenerative disease, which is Alzheimer's disease. And you look at uh, uh, genome-wide association studies, the variants that are most enriched here in um, uh, circled in green are uh, immune variants. They encode immune genes and actually mostly uh, myeloid genes. So I think uh, we would be, we're on the right track by zeroing in on the innate immune response. And so we um, have been looking at this interesting phenomenon where NSAIDs, so for example, ibuprofen, anaprosin, and dimethacin in normal aging populations. So these are not in uh, populations that have any kind of cognitive decline. There was a very nice preventive effect of taking NSAIDs. And this is a particularly nice study here out of the VA here in the US where if you took NSAIDs about four to five years uh, uh, and you're cognitively normal, your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease was significantly lower. And this has been shown in several other studies that I've listed here. And so this got us uh, thinking, well, uh, how does this work? Uh, is there something to this? Can we prevent, or uh, if we can figure out how, what, what, how this might be acting, could we potentially uh, prevent uh, this type of age-associated uh, neurodegenerative disease. And so NSAIDs, as you know, block uh, the cyclooxygenases, COX-2, COX-1, 
COX-2 is the mother of all uh, inflammatory enzymes. It drives production of multiple prostaglandins, but particularly PGE2, which is very well known uh, as an inflammatory modulator. Um, and PGE2 signals through uh, both uh, anti-inflammatory receptors like the EP4 receptor, which we worked on quite extensively, uh, and the EP2 receptor, which uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about. And when we first started, we thought, uh, well, let's try to figure out which of these receptors might be responsible for preclinical development of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and when we started around the same time, Tom Montine, as well as another uh, group, found that in Alzheimer's patients, uh, if you take their cerebrospinal fluid, you look at prostaglandin levels, uh, they in fact had quite high levels of PGE2 compared to controls. So uh, I think the PGE2 really is a very important uh, inflammatory mediator. So uh, over the years, we have looked at this pathway. We have tested uh, the EP3, 4, and 5 receptors quite extensively and found that of all those four receptors, the one you know, detrimental receptor is the EP2 receptor, which appears to be a master suppressor of multiple uh, very beneficial immune functions. For example, phagocytosis. You absolutely have to be able to clear pathogens or sterile damps in your body. You have to be able to terminate inflammation. EP2 uh, signaling uh, stops that. Uh, you have to be able to launch anti-inflammatory signaling. And then in the brain with microglia, uh, microglia are very important in generating tro trophic factors. And so uh, we have used a number of models, but uh, this was our. This is where we started. Uh, um, I'm going to tell you about a recent study, but we knew that at least in microglia, this is a very schematic representation of a microglial cell, uh, but uh, it's uh, light blue, uh, which uh, is means that it's healthy uh, with age or with uh, 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 protein accumulation like a beta 42 it loses uh, its pro-inflammatory capacity, or it, it gains pro-inflammatory capacity, it loses a lot of its homeostatic functions like phagocy phagocytosis and trophic support neurons. But if we conditionally delete this uh, EP2 receptor using this particular Cree uh, recombinase line, we actually can uh, restore a lot of the uh, 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 nice functions, the youthful functions uh, of microglia. So um, back to aging. Uh, so what is it that drives um, uh, this age-associated inflammation? And so in more recent studies, what we've uh, discovered is that uh, bioenergetics is extremely important. So if your uh, car doesn't have enough gas or more appropriately now, if your electric car doesn't have a, a full charge, you know, you just, you can't go anywhere and you can't do anything. And so uh, what we found is that uh, in immune cells, particularly innate immune cells with age, we have a fairly profound decline in glycolysis and mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. And if you recall your biochemistry, you start with glucose, you go down glycolysis to pyruvate, which then feeds the TCA, which then feeds uh, electron transport and ATP production. And what we found uh, when we looked at both human uh, uh, monocyte-derived macrophages as well as uh, mouse uh, primary macrophages is with age, we have this uh, very significant decline in a number of crucial uh, metabolic uh, intermediates, particularly in glycolysis. You can see here, comparing age to young, uh, pentose phosphate, very important for uh, purine and pure pyrimidine uh, synthesis, uh, and then TCA. And we also saw this uh, peculiar uh, uptick in glycogen metabolites. And this actually uh, has functional consequences. So if we, we can do, uh, we can measure bioenergetic capacity using the seahorse. And there we find very significant declines, both in mitochondrial basal respiration. So here's young and here's aged, uh, as well as in glycolysis, uh, here's young and here's aged. Now this is completely different from what everybody assumes 
uh, like the Warburg, um, the Warburg phenomenon, which is a completely different uh, bioenergetic um, um, ad adaptation where you have increase in glycolysis and decrease in mitochondrial oxfos. And this is found in infectious uh, diseases or in cancer. So we wondered, uh, well, maybe the EP2 receptor uh, actually was eliciting all this uh, maladaptive or detrimental uh, inflammation and poor immune responses by suppressing energy metabolism. And, how, and so the first thing we did was just to simply look at human uh, macrophages um, and, uh, uh, and do a dose response with PG2 uh, and with the EP2 agonist. Uh, and you find this very, very consistent and reproducible decline in both basal respiration here in blue and glycolysis in red. And you saw that as well for the EP2 agonist, but not for the other uh, receptors. And now if we go to our genetic model that I had mentioned, where we have deleted EP2 just in myeloid cells, and we look by electron microscopy at macrophages, primary macrophages, we see, uh, and we look at the mitochondria, we see these very beautiful electron-dense uh, mitochondria here uh, in red. Uh, here are the aged uh, mitochondria. They look uh, terrible. They're still, you know, limping along, but uh, they are not electron dense. They're very round, large. Uh, now we look in our aged um, conditional knockouts where we don't have EP2 in myeloid cells, and um, we find a, a complete prevention of this morphological uh, decline of mitochondria. And so uh, we looked a little bit more, uh, it's very mechanistic. I'll just have two slides on uh, the nitty gritty uh, molecular mechanisms here. But uh, when we think about uh, uh, activation of the EP2 receptor, EP2 of course is a GPCR um, through the cyclic AMP, uh, it's connected to AKT, which is a very powerful uh, central kinase. Uh, AKT then phosphorylates G GSK3 beta, the sole purpose of GSK3 beta is to inhibit other enzymes. Um, and by um, inhibiting uh, EP2, what we es essentially do is we prevent uh, AKT from uh, disinhibiting or from inhibiting GSK3 beta, and we basically take out glycogen synthase. And so uh, what we found was that in these myeloid knockouts, uh, if we took out uh, EP2, we had uh, less glycogen compared to controls. So what's happening is that glucose is being shunted towards glycogen, but it's not going down glyc glycolysis to feed the TCA. So that, that's not good. And then um, we also showed proof of concept then that if we go in and uh, basically take out glycogen synthase using shRNA in these human uh, macrophages, not only can we restore healthy uh, mitochondrial uh, respiration and glycolysis, but as expected, we can also restore um, a very nice uh, homeostatic immune responses. So here are aged uh, human macrophages here on the right, and you can see that they are highly inflammatory. There's IL-1 beta. Um, however, if you take out the glycogen synthase, now they revert and they're indistinguishable from young macrophages and they uh, express a complement of very, very homeostatic anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines and chemokines. So, um, so the next question was, well, uh, what happens with aging um, in uh, human monocytes and macrophages? And what we found was that uh, with age, and this was quite uh, profound for us is that uh, they actually make a lot more PG2 and uh, both in the cells and they also uh, secrete more PG2 when they're aged as compared to where they're young. And not only that, they express a lot more uh, EP2 receptors as opposed, and they don't express the others. And so you actually, with aging, you have this pathway really is on hyperdrive. And of course, we need to model things in mice. So we also checked in mice and 
Aging mice also make a lot more PG2 in the plasma. They also have a lot more PG2 in the cortex. And interestingly, uh, the other prostaglandins are completely unchanged with aging. So this is a very highly specific thing. And of course, mice, we are very happy to see also uh, rev up their expression of EP2 with aging. So what happens in vivo? So if we age our mice that do not have myeloid EP2, these are our conditional knockouts, we find something very dramatic, which is that uh, if we look at plasma and hippocampal uh, immune factors using a multi-analyte platform like the Luminex, what we find is that the aged uh, control mice have very high levels of super inflammatory uh, cytokines. You'll recognize IL-18 and IL-1-beta as being uh, part of the inflammasome. Uh, that makes EP2 upstream of the inflammasome. And we find that in our aged conditional knockouts, uh, the plasma is really indistinguishable from the young. So we've essentially rejuvenated the plasma. And similarly, we find a similar segregation uh, 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 in the hippocampus, where the hippocampus is also uh, in, uh, immunologically uh, more youthful than uh, the aged hippocampus. And so this has consequences. This has very good consequences. The hippocampus is exquisitely sensitive to inflammation. And uh, if we do something called uh, the Barnes maze, which is a very uh, reliable way to test spatial memory, uh, I'll just uh, uh, draw your attention to uh, these two tracings. These are actually very large white discs. You place the mouse in the center. It has been trained to find this target hole to escape because mice do not like to be on bright white discs um, with a shining light. So the, the, uh, the wild type old mouse still, after all this training, cannot remember how to get out. Uh, whereas the um, uh, old mice, old mouse that has no EP2 in its myeloid cells has perfect recall and remembers exactly where to go. Um, and this is uh, plotted here. And we also uh, used an orthogonal measure, which is to look at synaptic potentiation or synaptic strength, which we know uh, is uh, very, very uh, much lower in aged uh, hippocampus compared to young, which is young is here in black. Um, but the aged uh, conditional knockouts actually had uh, long-term potentiation essentially the same as young. So we have re re renewed um, synaptic, we have revived uh, our synaptic uh, potentiation in these old mice. Um, I'm just going to summarize a very long study uh, just to give you sort of the molecular feel for what this is. But in a young myeloid cell, we have uh, you know homeostatic levels of, of PGE2 circulating. Um, there are homeostatic levels of EP2, and we have very nice uh, bioenergetics that fuel uh, very good immune responses like phagocytosis and resolution of inflammation in the old myeloid cell. However, we have much more PG2, we have much more EP2, and this, uh, instead of uh, uh, helping uh, glucose go down into and fuel mitochondrial respiration, is actually shunted towards glycogen. So um, what is uh, the consequence of this now if we try a pharmacological agent? And these are, uh, this is a pharmacological agent, we call it a compound 52. Uh, this is a brain penetrant EP2 receptor. It is part of a large series of compounds that was published by Amgen. Um, and uh, when we administered this just for about two to four weeks uh, in old mice, we were able to uh, really uh, reverse a lot of aging phenotypes. For example, in the plasma, here are the aged mice, and again, they are pretty inflammatory, but the aged mice that got this compound are indistinguishable from the young. Similarly, in the hippocampus, uh, we find this same uh, uh, rejuvenation. Um, in the Barnes maze, which is the spatial memory um, uh, behavior, we are also able to reverse and restore normal cognitive function. 
And uh, in the electrophysiology paradigm that I showed you, long-term potentiation, again, we were also able, they are here in blue, they uh, are restored to youthful levels. So the pharmacology recapitulates the genetics, which is pretty interesting. It also indicates that cognitive decline, at least in a mouse, um, is reversible, uh, which is something that we were somewhat shocked uh, by in, in seeing this. And if, again, I wanted just to show you these, these beautiful images uh, by electron microscopy. So now this is in the brain uh, where we did electron microscopy. We found the microglia. And what we can see with uh, about four weeks of uh, compound 52 or EP2 inhibitor treatment is here are the young, here are the aged. Um, what we find is if you look at the young, you have these very beautiful uh, mitochondria, uh, very electron dense. The old, again, as I showed before, they are sort of very pale, round, globular. However, in the uh, after two to four weeks, we find that the mitochondria in the microglia are starting to look a little bit more like young mitochondria. This is uh, uh, profiled here. So um, I'll just finish with uh, one last experiment, which is uh, very interesting for uh, to us. Uh, when we looked at a non-brain penetrant EP2 inhibitor, and we checked this by um, uh, mass spec, again, this is does not get into the brain. Now, so we're talking now purely peripheral uh, inhibition of inflammatory EP2. And we found, uh, we expected to see this in the plasma as uh, we had expected to see a, you know, a, a, a restoration of youthful uh, immune factors in the plasma, but what we did not expect was to also see it in the hippocampus. This was a real surprise. How, does, how can this happen? Um, and uh, we, and uh, along with that, we saw a restoration of spatial memory and a very nice restoration of synaptic potentiation in the hippocampus. And so we're currently uh, trying to uh, understand how this happens, how you ha can have a brain penetrant, I mean, a, a non-brain penetrant uh, inhibition of an immune pathway have effects on the brain. And so I'll stop here. Um, uh, this is our current current model uh, where we we know from other studies that myeloid metabolism declines quite significantly with aging. Uh, this is uh, and this enables uh, progressive uh, de uh, development of detrimental inflammation, which through the uh, blood brain barrier is eliciting uh, a change in cognitive function. And we know from what I just showed you that if we inhibit this peripheral, peripherally, this, in, this EP2 immune pathway, we can actually not just restore my, myeloid metabolism and systemic uh, immune status, but we also restore uh, cognitive function. Okay, and so I'll stop there. Uh, I, the most important slide is acknowledgements. Uh, I do wanna highlight uh, several members of the lab, Paras Minhas, and um, uh, Aaron Blocher, who have uh, done a lot of the work uh, that I showed here and uh, our funding sources. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. That was a really fascinating talk. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of asking, we have what, time for one question, and, and I will take that question. Um, I was wondering about the glycogen shunting. If, if you can speculate as to why the cells are doing that, if it has a protective effect or is it a side effect of some other metabolic disturbances or why do the cells do that? Yeah, we, we're, we're chasing that right now. I mean, it's, it, uh, we see uh, glycogen is, is not very widely distributed, uh, but it seems to accumulate with age, not just in macrophages, but we also see it in aging astrocytes. Um, and so it's probably uh, now why you get more uh, glycogen accumulation. It probably has to do with an increased uh, glycogen synthase activity, which could be 
uh, directly uh, related to increasing EP2 or other pathways that are feeding into the AKT pathway. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, we do find that um, the astrocytic glycogen uh, seems to um, decrease to more normal levels with uh, EP2 inhibition. So uh, I think everything um, may boil down to glucose availability and glucose flux um, in these cells. All right. Thank you so much, Katrin. It was great to, to see you here. And let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.